All right, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. So let me share my screen here because I have a presentation for you all. And let me make sure that I've got the sound shared. Perfect. All right, so um, like Brownman said, my name is Tiffany Bright. I'm the Southeast Regional Director of an organization called the Rattlesnake Conservancy. And I'm really thankful for the opportunity to tell you a little more about what we do, some of the threats and challenges rattlesnakes are facing, why it matters, and how you can get involved as well. Um, we're going to start out with a short little video. At the Rattlesnake Conservancy, we are committed to helping people coexist with rattlesnakes. Staff at the Rattlesnake Conservancy are passionate about teaching people about wildlife and rattlesnakes. It's important that young people's first interaction with a rattlesnake is a positive one, and that they learn to respect and love wildlife rather than fear it. Being scared of snakes is not something that's ingrained in us, it's something that's taught to us. And that taught behavior is something that we try and work with individuals to change their perception to be more open-minded to coexisting with those natural animals. Our mission is to advance the protection of rattlesnakes and their habitat through research and education. Many rattlesnakes are in steep decline because of indiscriminate killing, habitat destruction and fragmentation, and even rattlesnake roundups, where they are collected by the thousands and killed in a public display. To reduce the number of snakes that are killed due to negative wildlife interactions, we train individuals to safely handle, transport, and effectively relocate venomous snakes. The Tony and Chase are extremely knowledgeable. Um, their, their protocols are very focused on safety, um, but they also understand the reality of working in the field. So they've just been a wealth of knowledge, and uh, I feel like they've ran the course in a very, very professional manner. Outside of our education and training programs, we work with private and public landowners to conserve habitat for not only rattlesnakes, but all native species. In cooperation with our partner organizations, we work with landowners to manage their property for native wildlife and gain conservation easements where possible. The Rattlesnake Conservancy's research programs are focused to provide on-the-ground conservation benefit, monitor disease and pathogen risks, and improve our understanding of rattlesnake natural history so that we can effectively conserve these species. To join the team at the Rattlesnake Conservancy, go online today to savethebuzztails.org to become a member, find education resources for classrooms, volunteer, or provide financial assistance. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that short video um, about our organization. So the Rattlesnake Conservancy is a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to advance the protection of rattlesnakes and their habitat through research and education. We were founded in 2015 by native Floridians who really understand some of the nuances and intricacies of living alongside some potentially dangerous wildlife. Um, we began our work at that time as the Eastern Diamondback Found, uh, Conservation Foundation. So at that time, the founders of our organization had kind of decided that the Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake was an animal needing extra advocacy and protection. And we have, um, we call it now what we now know as a crotalid of special concern. The Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake was petitioned to be listed under the Endangered Species Act back in 2011. That listing is still under review today, almost 11 years later. Um, they're considered to be likely extirpated in Louisiana, where there hasn't been a breeding population in a long time, and they're very rare and isolated in North Carolina. Their populations are steadily declining throughout their range. Um, as we've kind of expanded as an organization, both geographically and in resources, we changed our name to the Rattlesnake Conservancy to reflect a larger body of work and identified some other crotalids of special concern, including this guy, the Eastern Massasauga Rattlesnake. Um, this rattlesnake ranges up into portions of the Midwest and in parts of Canada. It's one of only a few rattlesnake species in Canada, which is pretty cool. And the Eastern Massasauga is one of two rattlesnakes that is currently listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. A threatened species is an animal that's likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future if we don't take any action to prevent that. This is one of my favorites, the timber rattlesnake, or as we call them here in the Southeast, the canebrake rattlesnake. 
These animals have a really fascinating part in American history and as part of the American Revolution, you can actually find a quote from Benjamin Franklin where he thought this animal should be the emblem of America. Um, unfortunately, they're also in steady decline throughout their populations. They're no longer found in a lot of those northeastern states that made up those original 13 colonies. Um, they're considered to be extinct in their former range in Canada, and um, they're currently unprotected. And then finally, we have this guy, the New Mexican ridge-nosed rattlesnake. And like the Eastern Massasauga, this is the other rattlesnake that is actually listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. Again, that means it's an animal that's likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future if we don't take any action. So as we're looking at rattlesnake species, pretty much across the board, no matter what species it is and no matter what, where they range, we're finding a steady decline in their population. So what are some of the threats and challenges that rattlesnakes are facing? So rattlesnakes are gonna have to contend with kind of universal threats that all animals really are facing. Things like habitat loss and fragmentation, um, urban development, road mortality, but rattlesnakes also have this unique threat of public perception and human persecution, where they're often vilified on social media and in popular culture and on the news. Um, this is my favorite headline, rattlesnakes waking up hungry in Arizona. So, you know, hide your kids, hide your wives, and just the way that they're portrayed in the media. Also rattlesnake roundups, which we'll get into in a minute here. Um, for those of you like me who grew up watching the Crocodile Hunter, Steve Irwin made this quote, the message is simple, love and conserve our wildlife. And I love that quote because it's so succinct and it's so effective and it's so to the point. And for some animals, the message really is that simple. It's easy to get people on board with wanting to save the sea turtles and save the pandas and rattlesnakes can be a much harder sell. To be fair, they do have the potential to be dangerous. So we like to get some scary things out of the way first. So in the United States annually, we're looking at about 4.7 million bite incidents, which works out to around nine per minute, which means that since I started this presentation, we've already had several bite incidents in the United States. So dogs are pretty terrifying animals, which is why we often hear the only good dog is a dead dog. Just kidding. We never hear that. We love dogs, by the way. These are my dogs. Um, I'm a big dog fan. But the fact is that an unleashed dog in your neighborhood is a much greater risk to you and your family than a venomous snake that might be passing through. But of course, people fear what they don't understand. So actual venomous snake bites. And these are the real numbers now. Um, and this covers also our copperheads and cottonmouths, not just rattlesnakes, but all venomous snake bites in the United States. Turns out that we're only looking at about seven to 8,000 per year. And only a handful of those are fatal every year. So this means that you have a better chance statistically of dying from a lightning strike or a bee sting or falling off your ladder in your Venom Saves Lives t-shirt, which you can buy on our website. And also rattlesnake roundups. Um, so for anyone who's never heard of a rattlesnake roundup, a rattlesnake roundup is a local festival type event. It's something that has carnival rides and food trucks, and it's kind of a family, you know, event that people seek out. And it's the largest public display of wildlife slaughter worldwide. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like. They're just rounding up as many rattlesnakes as they can from the environment and kind of killing them in a public spectacle. And if it was any other animal, it's definitely something that we wouldn't allow. Unfortunately, collecting wild rattlesnakes has an effect on the ecosystem beyond just on rattlesnakes. We know that rattlesnakes take refuge in what you see in this illustration here is a gopher tortoise burrow, and there's been over 400 other animals documented using these burrows. They'll also take refuge in rocky crevices and other habitat that makes a great spot for multiple animals. Unfortunately, we know that some of the methods that these roundup organizers and hunters are using to collect them are unsustainable and unethical and affect these animals. So things like gassing, which is literally pouring gasoline into those burrows and crevices to collect the rattlesnakes that come out. And of course, that's going to affect all the other animals in those homes as well. So why do we still allow rattlesnake roundups? Um, the organizers of the events often claim that the venom that they collect at these events is donated to science, but we know that that's not true. There are two anti-venom manufacturers in the United States and they both have their own venom lines. They're not using any venom that's collected at these events. And the venom's not collected in a sterile way. They don't have a way to freeze dry it down or anything like that. So it's not being used in science and medicine. 
The organizers also claim that they're kind of performing a community service by controlling a population of rattlesnakes, but there's never been a study that documented an overabundance of rattlesnakes anywhere. And in fact, what we see is the opposite. We also know that because of some of the unsustainable methods they're using to catch rattlesnakes, like pouring gasoline into those crevices and burrows, can actually cause more human snake conflict because if they're not collecting the rattlesnakes, they've rendered that refuge completely unsuitable. So now the rattlesnakes will be on the move looking for somewhere safe to go, which may include crossing a road or going under people's sheds or into people's property. So finally, the economic impact. And this is a real um, positive impact of these events for these areas, especially towns like Sweetwater, Texas. Um, their rattlesnake roundup that they host there is the largest ecotourism that they get from anything. So it's very important to these towns. So what are we doing about it? The biggest thing is cooperative conservation. So we like to say that we're builders, not activists. So you're not gonna find us picketing outside of these events or throwing red paint on the families coming and going. We want to work together with the organizers to provide an alternative. And one example of that is what you see here in the picture. This is from the Rattlesnake Festival in Claxton, Georgia, which was formerly a, round, a rattlesnake roundup. They've now transitioned into more of a conservation and education focused festival. Like you can see here, people are still able to come to the event. They're still able to see rattlesnakes. They still host their beauty pageant and all of the traditions. And the best part is these animals get to go home at the end of the night. And that's thanks to partnerships with facilities like the Chiha Zoo in Albany, Georgia, which our organization, along with other state organizations and institutions, was able to donate several captive rattlesnake species to be housed there at the zoo so that when there are events in the southeast, they have access to a captive colony of rattlesnakes that they can use and they're not having to go capture wild rattlesnakes for the events. Um, and like I said, the rattlesnakes get to go back to their home at the end of the event and be used for future events, which is really a great thing. So we're always looking for more zoos and programs who are looking to breed local species to offer these alternatives. We also work with state wildlife agencies trying to develop management guidelines and relocation guidelines like instituting bag limits or banning gassing, um, providing connectivity to existing conservation lands through things like wildlife bridges, and of course, considering reintroducing some of these animals in areas where they formerly ranged. Hey, Tiffany, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. It's Bronwyn. Stella had a question. What is DF? I don't, I don't know if that was on a, a slide that was beforehand. DF or Stella, what is what were you talking about with DF? No, okay. Do you see it, Bronwyn? Never mind, keep going. <laughs> okay. All right, so education is one of our biggest programs as an organization. We think that education is the key to conservation and that it's likely to result in a higher conservation benefit really than anything else that we can do. Um, for those of us who are educators or who are parents or who have our own kids or work in places like natural history museums or zoos or these facilities where we'll be engaging with the public, there's this book called The Last Child in the Woods that all of us really should read. It's a wonderful book. And in it, the author coins this term nature deficit disorder as a way to describe this phenomenon that this current generation is facing and the disconnect that they're experiencing from the natural world. And in the book, we see some pretty abysmal statistics outlined, like on any given day, 29% of babies under the age of one or watching TV and videos for about 90 minutes. Almost a third of children play outside for 30 minutes or less a day and one in five won't go outside at all on an average day to play. And as a contrast, we know that nature is vitally important to children's development. Kids have this big work of engaging the world with their bodies and they need to run through streams and flip over rocks and climb trees. And we know that they're not getting those experiences. But for me, the best takeaway of the book and the thing that makes me feel um, so hopeful as a conservationist is this. Positive direct experience in the outdoors and being taken outdoors by someone close to the child are the two factors that contribute most to individuals choosing to take action to benefit the environment as adults. 
And to me, this means that any time that we're outside with a child, whether it's our own or we're leading a group or we're teaching a class, we have this really special fleeting opportunity to ignite that passion and to help cultivate a connection to the natural world around them. And as an organization, we do this in a lot of ways. Um, we do it through outreach events where we come with biofacts and live animals and all sorts of things and visiting classrooms, of course. Instilling a sense of ownership through junior conservationist adoption kits where kids can adopt a rattlesnake and they get a certificate and a photo and a fact sheet and a stuffed animal, but most of all, they get a thank you letter that's written out to them that tells them exactly what their contributions are going towards because kids love to participate in real science and know that they're making a difference. And also through our educator resources. So anyone can go on our website right now and download for free all sorts of different printables and materials like posters and coloring books. And it's also filled with these classroom activities that are designed to teach children how to identify some of their native species, um, learn how to safely coexist alongside of them and also recognize some of the ecological benefits that they provide. And each activity comes with a handy classroom guide so that parents and teachers are able to implement the lesson kind of regardless of their own knowledge base on rattlesnakes. Also through venomous handling training. Um, so as an organization, we set the standard of safety in venomous handling and we teach classes all over the country to multiple professionals and construction companies and military installments and first responders and photographers and zookeepers and a wide variety of people and teach them how to respond to venomous snakes in their area. These courses have an awesome conservation benefit because when you empower one person with the skills and the equipment that they need to safely respond to venomous snakes, it has kind of a ripple effect in their community. And our courses are open to the public. We have a wide variety of people who take them. And also by offering first responder grants. So especially in rural communities, our first responders are gonna wear a lot of different hats. And sometimes that hat is somebody had a rattlesnake in their yard and they called 911 and a police officer or a firefighter gets dispatched and they don't know what to do with it. That's not a normal part of their training, you know? So we like to get them through our training so that they can respond to those calls safely, both for themselves and for the snakes and give them the equipment that they need to do that at no cost to themselves. As an organization, we're also doing a lot of research like studying the impacts of translocation on some of these rattlesnake species serving as a sample repository so that researchers all around the country and all around the world, if they need um, a venom sample or a species record or a scale clipping or a genetic sample or something like that can reach out to us and we can get that sent off to them. Habitat modeling so that we can prioritize certain areas strategically for conservation studying the impact of hormones on breeding and venom composition and behavior, and monitoring diseases in wild populations of venomous snakes. We also offer grant funding. So research into venomous snakes is some of the most underfunded area of science. And anybody who has a project that has an on the ground conservation benefit can apply to our grant. We just awarded our first international grant to a project studying the South American rattlesnake in Brazil. So we're all very excited about that. And why does it matter? Because as the Rattlesnake Conservancy, the most common question that we get asked is why do we wanna save these animals that could potentially you know, be dangerous to us or our pets or our children? Most of us know that rattlesnakes and venomous snakes in general are entirely adept predators and they're great at controlling the pest population. But what a lot of people don't realize is that rattlesnakes are also a really important prey item. Um, they're a natural prey item for things like king snakes and indigo snakes, including the federally protected eastern indigo snake. And even birds of prey and wading birds rely on healthy populations of snake as a prey item. So, you know, sometimes I talk to families who don't love the cottonmouth that lives in their retention pond alongside their home, but they love the great blue heron that flies in every day at sunset. And all of these things exist together in this really natural and delicate balance. And when you remove these animals, you're going to have an effect both up and down the food ladder. Rattlesnakes also serve some amazing ecological impacts. So rattlesnakes are seed dispersers. 
So this study from the University of California found that um, when a rodent consumes seeds, if they pass through the rodent's digestive system, they're lost, they don't germinate. But if a rattlesnake consumes that rodent either before the seeds are fully digested or while they're still stored in their cheek pouches, they do pass through the rattlesnake's digestive system and they do germinate. And of course the rattlesnake has a larger home range and that goes back into creating those microhabitats that the rodents and small mammals really depend on. And of course, it's also great for our pollen our birds and bats and bees and butterflies that we all love. Rattlesnakes also remove disease vectors from the environment. So one study from the University of Maryland found that one timber rattlesnake can remove up to 4,500 ticks annually from their environment. And we can further surmise because of that study that rattlesnakes control the spread of other rodent-borne illnesses and parasites as well through their natural predation. And finally, habitat preservation. John Muir said that when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it's attached to the rest of the world. And I think this is especially true with rattlesnakes and especially here in the Southeast region where I'm based out of. Our rattlesnake species rely on these upland pine dominated habitats that represent some of the most ecologically um, diverse habitats in the world and they're in decline. These areas are home to important ecological engineers like the pocket gopher who aerates the soil with their tunnels, which is really important for our native plants. They also provide home for critically endangered insects and also the gopher tortoise whose burrows have been a refuge for over 400 different animals documented using them. So when you're preserving habitat for rattlesnakes, it's not only the rattlesnakes that are gonna be benefiting. Venom applications. So for all of the scary things that venom can do, it's also a really amazing naturally occurring resource. It's composed of a very complex combination of proteins and poly, um, peptides and molecules and things that we can't easily reproduce in a lab. So venom is currently being researched or used in the treatment of fighting breast cancer, blood pressure, heart disease, bleeding disorders, diabetes, surgical adhesives, and even producing anti-venom. So if you know anybody who has had a major cardiovascular episode, their life was probably saved by the rattlesnake you see in this photo, the dusky pygmy rattlesnake, which is native to Florida. And that's because the drug Integralin, which helps prevent blood clots during heart attacks and other cardiovascular episodes, was made from mimicking a protein discovered in the venom of this snake. We know that venom is different um, between different species, but what a lot of people don't realize is there are also venom variations within the same species in different populations. And what that means is if we lose the population um, that has that variation, we've lost along with it all of that potential for medicine and science. And because it's a natural resource, it's something that we can't replace. So last of all, what can you do? <laughs> Of course, educate. We think that education is the difference between fear and respect, but I don't even like to use the word educate because I think as soon as you position yourself that way, that you know, maybe you have a neighbor that shows you a harmless snake that they killed or something like that, and you're kind of going, I'm going to educate this person, you've already lost them. Um, it's important that we use our knowledge as a platform for compassion, that we're meeting people in their shoes and using empathy and active listening. And maybe you know more about the snakes in their area, but they know more about the needs of their family and about their property. So it's important to approach these conversations from an empathetic standpoint and be willing to listen and use your compassion. And I guarantee you that it does have a ripple effect. Of course, volunteering, we always could use more volunteers making a donation or attending a venomous handling training, engaging with our social media pages. So you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. And we're working on a Twitter account. Um, organizing a community partnership. We're always looking for different clubs and organizations who want to sponsor first responders in their area to go through our trainings and sharing our message. So that's all I have for you about the Rattlesnake Conservancy and kind of the projects that we're working on and why we're working on them. Um, at this point, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Can you um, unshare? We'll come back together. Yeah. And I will, uh, let me put a spotlight on you. Um, okay, so do we have questions for Tiffany? I know that I have a ton of questions, but I'll let y'all go first. If you have a question, um, put it in the chat box or 
raise your hand and um, I can, uh, I'll can recognize you and you can unmute and ask a question. Um, Stephanie just signed up for venomous hand, snake handling class in Florida. I would love to have one and uh, have y'all come up to Maryland and do one up here. So I'm not sure I'll, I'll be contacting you after the presentation for that. Please do, we would absolutely love that. Jeffrey asks, how many species of rattlesnakes are there? Oh boy, that is a really good question. And the answer is always changing because these animals, the taxonomy is changing and they're getting split from being subspecies back into species. So I don't have an exact number for you. I can tell you that here in the Southeast region where I'm at, we have three different species of rattlesnake, but in places like Texas, there are seven different species and places like Arizona, I think there are 17. And if you check out the coloring books on our educator resources section, you can see some of that. We also have a database on our website that lists a lot of the rattlesnake species around the world, but I don't know the exact number that there are. All right. Um, are you seeing this? Charles says, how can someone from New York support the effort? Um, yeah. We actually just had someone from New York come down to take one of our trainings and that was wonderful. And you're right, the timber rattlesnakes are becoming increasingly isolated and harder to find and less likely to find up there. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do. I will say that we are in the middle of a holiday membership drive right now and we only need 14 more members to reach our goals. So if that's something that you're interested in, definitely visit our website. Um, and also, you know, just um, something that you could do remotely when you're not here in this area is through just engaging with us on social media. Every time that you share a post or like or comment, it spreads it further into the social media universe. And it does help with changing people's minds and attitudes about these animals. And I would also add, try to find a HERP club that's in your area or is our Natural History Society, um, similar to what we have, because they're always involved in different um, outreach efforts to educate people and, and kind of uh, do um, uh, that kind of outreach. And Troy wants to know, tell us about the rattle. Sure. So the rattle is made of keratin, just like our fingernails. So it breaks off in the wild really regularly. Rattlesnakes do get a segment every single time that they shed, but because the rattle breaks off pretty regularly, you can't really tell their age like some people think. They can also shed more than once in a year. Um, some people think that the rattle is filled with little beads like a maraca but it's actually completely hollow. And what's making the sound is those segments knocking together. Um, when an adult large rattlesnake is rattling, that sound can actually reach 80 decibels, which is louder than some vacuum cleaners. So they get pretty powerful there with the noise. Um, and then let's see, Ryan wanted to know about the timber rattler. You, you mentioned that it was declining. Are they making a comeback? I see that. So how's the situation with the timber rattler? Unfortunately, it's not great. Um, they're definitely extinct in Canada. You can no longer find them up there. There's a lot of those northeastern states that they no longer range into. Um, and not much is being done right now to help their numbers. It's definitely something that, um, that we're working on that we're trying to raise awareness for. Stephanie thought uh, she heard that the cane break and the timber rattlesnake used to be two different species and now they're considered one. Yes, so um, the cane break rattlesnake used to be a different subspecies from the timber rattler and they got lumped together. And so right now they're considered to be the same species, just Crotalus horridus. Um, they do have some really unique differences in their habitats and the kind of things that they use and that they need in their behaviors. Um, there's also a really interesting venom variation where the cane break rattlesnakes here in the Southeast actually have a neurotoxic component to their venom. but um, um, as far as taxonomy goes, they are still considered the same species. Um, I know that you, met, you you put up there that you're doing some studies or some on relocation effects. So can you tell us what's going on, what you're finding? 
Definitely. So, um, you know, we have a lot of well-meaning people that maybe they found a rattlesnake in their neighborhood because of all the urban development and they're able to get it into a trash can or some other container and they're like, I'm going to drive you 100 miles south to, you know, a natural preserve and you're never going to see another human again and like, you know, have, have a great life, little guy. And unfortunately, it just doesn't work like that. These animals really rely on their home ranges. Um, they know where to find all the food and the shelter and the water. So it's not as easy as relocating them. Them. And we're definitely trying to find out what kind of situations that we can move them, how far can we move them and have the animals still thrive. Uh, Joe wants to know, well, uh, he comes across uh, rattlesnakes with timber rattlers on the Appalachian Trail on the AT. And what is your recommendation for avoiding rattlesnakes? I think a lot of people want to see the rattlesnakes that are on here, but, but there could be some people who don't. So how do you avoid them? Absolutely. And that's a really good question. Um, the most important thing to do is to wear proper shoes when you're in natural areas and not be walking, especially in areas with tall grass and places where you can't see or not sticking our hands in those places. Um, and just checking the area, you know, before you lay out your campsite at the night and just checking and making sure that there aren't any snakes. Um, as far as people that want to keep them away from their yard, rattlesnakes have needs just like we do. They need food and water and shelter and removing those needs sometimes can keep them away. So if you don't have a food source and a water source for them and you're keeping your yard clear, um, that's a really good way to avoid them at home. Um, the dual family wants to know how the diamondback rattlesnakes are doing in terms of trends. Sure. So um, they were petitioned to be listed as an endangered species, actually, back in 2011. That listing is still under review, so they're not listed. They don't have any kind of federal protection. They do have some level of protection in certain states, like in North Carolina. Um, their populations in North Carolina are pretty isolated and uncommon. They're no longer breeding in Louisiana, so they're considered to be extirpated in that state as well. Um, so they're definitely in decline also. Um, the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake particularly is a very slow growing species. So when you see one that's a five foot or a six foot animal that somebody's killed, um, unfortunately that could easily be a 12, 13, 15 year old animal that you're seeing. Um, it takes them a long time to reach those sizes and it takes them a good amount of time to reach breeding size. Um, so when you're removing an individual from the population, it can have a huge effect on it because they're not going to breed every year like other animals, and it takes them so long to reach those sizes. Uh, a couple more questions about the relocation. Have you seen a difference in behavior in rattlesnakes that have been brought into captivity versus wild ones that are relocated? Um, definitely. So a lot of times these animals, when you're bringing them in from the wild, they can have a very, very difficult time adjusting to captivity. Um, unfortunately, it's not always an easy answer because sometimes when their habitat has been removed, and especially when we're seeing things like new housing developments go up and new roads and things like that, sometimes there's not always a great area to relocate them to that's within that range that they would have used. Um, and so sometimes we do take them into captivity if there's not any good answers on where to move them. Um, we try not to take any into captivity that we don't have to, but they do sometimes have a hard time adjusting to captivity. Um, as far as being relocated, if they're relocated within, let's say, a fourth of a mile, they're generally going to do a lot better than if they're taken to a completely different location. When they're relocated a far distance, they don't do very well. They don't adjust and they tend to just be on the move constantly constantly looking for those things, the shelter and the food and water sources. Is it illegal to relocate a venomous snake without certification, Stephanie asks. Um, definitely, it can be in some states here in Florida. You do need a permit in order to possess venomous reptiles. Um, so there's going to be different state regulations and different um, county regulations even within certain states. So it's really important to know what those are if you plan on getting into relocation. Uh, Mariah asked, do you partner with veterinary hospitals to care for wounded rattles? Yeah, so we actually have a partnership with um, a veterinary, uh, a vet here in Jacksonville, Florida. His name is Dr. Colbert, um, and he works at an exotic bird hospital here, and he's helped us with a lot of our animals. The vet team at uni uh, the University of Florida Hospital are also really wonderful in caring for the venomous snakes, and we do have a vet on our um 
advisory committee, Dr. Gordon Smock, and he's amazing at also helping when we find injured rattlesnakes that have been hit by a car or something like that. Ryan's in Arizona, and he says that there's a lot of poaching going on. Mm -hmm. What advice do you give to help um, prevent poaching? Um, that, that's a really good point, and that's definitely something that our executive director is working on. We have kind of amassed a Montane Rattlesnake Working Group um, filled with different state agency personnel and different scientists that are working on figuring out how widespread that problem is and how it's affecting the rattlesnakes there. Um, and we're hoping that we can make an impact on it. It, it, it is hard and I, I feel your frustration, Ryan, because a lot of times, even when you know someone's breaking the law and even when you know they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing with a rattlesnake, it is often overlooked. I guess, I mean, can you report, can you report people to a enforcement agency? Absolutely, you can report you can report them to your state's um, you know DNR or here in Florida, it's our Florida uh, Wildlife Conservation Commission or like Ryan said, Arizona Fish and Game. So you'll have kind of these different agencies depending on what state you're in, and you absolutely can report them for things like that. And Russ, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Russ, but I think I mean I think killing any snake in Maryland is illegal. I'll wait to hear from him. Uh, Nick says yes. Do you have a favorite species of uh, to work with? That's what he asks. Um, I I I really love our canebrake rattlesnakes here in the southeast. Um, tiger rattlesnakes in the southwest are one of my very favorite species. They're just really fascinating to me. Um, I think as far as handling, a large eastern diamondback rattlesnake is probably going to be the one that gives you the most um, run for your money. They can be really, really difficult to work with. Um, so that's always a fun challenge. Um, Stella's putting how many dogs out of 10 get bitten by rattlesnakes? I'm not sure I understand the question, but maybe you do. I'm, I'm not sure either. Um, out of 10, I don't know. And it, it also, it just kind of depends where there are. Pets do kind of fare a little bit differently than we do when they're bitten by rattlesnakes. Um, I'm not sure exactly the, mo the numbers on that, though. Yeah, bro, I'm, I'm sorry. I was out of the room. I think you asked me a question. It is illegal um, in Maryland to kill any snake. But it's incredibly right, difficult. It's incredibly difficult to enforce, like some of the comments about people poaching. Like I've been herping out in Texas, and it's against the law to take snakes off the roads out there. But the, the officers have hundreds of thousands of acres or miles and miles and miles of land to try to cover. So it's very difficult for them. And I'm pretty sure it's the same in Arizona. That, but the laws are there to protect these animals. It's just really hard to enforce, unfortunately. Um, let's see, Sam wants to know, what's the most aggressive species? Um, so I think the best thing about taking out a rattlesnake in a room full of people is how anticlimactic it can be. Sometimes you just kind of take them out of the bucket and they just kind of, you know, sit there looking at you. And um, I think we have this idea in our head that they're aggressive and that they're going to come towards us. But I haven't really found any species of rattlesnake or snake in general to be any more or less aggressive. They're all kind of individuals. Um, some of them, especially if they're in shed and they can't see very well, they might tend to be a little bit more defensive. But I haven't found any one species to be any more defensive than another one. Um, well, which ones make great pets, Nick asks. I don't know if rattlesnakes do, but maybe. Um, they can be really challenging to keep in captivity, so they don't necessarily make great pets. But if you're like me, I, I would just say all of them. Uh, are you familiar with the Rep Recovery Center in Deland? Yes, we're great friends with um, Carl and Mara there at the Reptile Discovery Center. It's a great facility, and we hosted our annual fundraiser, Get Buzz for Buzz Tales, there a couple years ago. And Mariah has a ball python, so she, she recommends ball pythons as pets. Uh, she loves her baby, and I'm sure that there are other ones you could put in there, what your, your favorite uh, pet snake is and your recommendations. Um, let's see, 
it's illegal, but it's illegal in Maryland to keep venomous snakes. So Allison wants to know which ones are the hardest to work with, uh, temperament, size, etc. I think um, the large eastern diamondbacks for me have been the most challenging to work with in captivity. They're incredibly strong animals. They can be very smart and pick up on patterns and your heat signature as soon as you walk into the room. Um, so, so they're always a fun challenge. Um, I have a question. You mentioned, you know, that you're not into educating, and I appreciate that. Um, you want to meet people where they are. Um, do, do you have any tips on how to start that conversation if people are anti-snake, on how to uh, give any tips on, on what you can do that's not uh, confrontational in terms of talking to folks? Sure, and it can be really challenging um, because snakes are so misunderstood. And I think we hear these stories sometimes and you know they kind of get repeated and become a part of our social consciousness. And so a lot of times you're gonna have people that have these very strongly held um, ideas or fears or whatever you wanna call them about snakes. And I think a lot of times people learn um, from what we're doing. And, and you know, when you're sharing your own experiences and you know, you're posting your own experiences on social media, I think people are seeing that. And sometimes you'll, you'll find that they're gonna be the ones to open that conversation with you. Um, and I had another question on the, Oh, I don't know here. Where was I putting? Oh, the pencil. I was surprised to see that there were rattlesnake roundups marked in Pennsylvania. What? Where are those? And what's what's up with that? Because that's near that's near where we are. Right. Right. Um, I'm not sure exactly where they are in Pennsylvania. I'm not very familiar with that state, but I will say that Pennsylvania is one of the states that has at least some guidelines on, you know, how many rattlesnakes are able to be hunted and used in the events. So I think the hunters in Pennsylvania um, are only able to harvest or hunt two rattlesnakes a year. It might even be one now. Um, so there is at least some regulation, and I think that's a positive step as far as the roundups go. Um, and, and I have talked to people from Pennsylvania and see some minds changing that even when hunters are bringing, you know, catching wild snakes and bringing them to the event, they end up taking them back to where they found them and letting them go. Looks like Sam says Cross Fork, Pennsylvania is where one of the roundups is. Earlier on, somebody asked how do they kill the snakes when people, uh, for these roundups, you said that they do it as a mass kind of kill off or? Um, in places like Sweetwater, Texas, definitely. And, you know, you can go and you, you can see a lot of that happening um, on their website and seeing photos of the event. It's a, it can be a, a done as like a really big spectacle. It just kind of depends on which um, event that we're talking about. Let's see. Um, we have how important is it to wear snake boots every time you're in the woods that have rattlesnakes and other venomous snakes? Troy's asking. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, if you don't have to be on guard at all times necessarily, Troy, but just like being conscious of where you're stepping and where you're placing your feet, not kind of going through tall grasses and things like that, where there might be a snake, um, staying on the trail and just paying attention to what else could be on the trail and just wearing a good pair of shoes can prevent a lot of bites that happen. Um, there's, you know, those um, kind of hiking sandals are really popular right now for people that are going on day hikes. And I would recommend actually having a pair of closed toed good shoes on if you're going to be in natural areas where you might encounter venomous snakes. What do you talk about? It's also where you put your hands um, when you're looking at under rocks. Yeah, absolutely. When before you're, you know, grabbing things or uh, it can happen when you're gardening or, you know, picking berries or something. We just want to be really careful about where we're putting our hands and making sure that we can see what's there before we're doing that. Especially when we're talking about things like bushes and rocks and, and that kind of thing. Allison wants to know what's the most often encountered species. And I don't know if that means snake or, or just rattlesnake in particular? Um, that's definitely going to depend on where you're at. Here in my area, I think the dusky pygmy rattlesnake is going to be the most common one that people encounter here. But, if, you know, that's going to change just depending on where you are and what kind of animals use that habitat. 
Um, and going back to Troy, you know, we, if uh, we do, um, especially with the club, go out on her hikes and go out actively looking for all kinds of um, reptiles and amphibians. And so when you're going out there with folks who are used to doing that, they can help you find them and then um, experience uh, what it is. And I think that, that doing that, um, taking, having those experiences can also help um, alleviate any fear that somebody might have um, uh, in walking into the woods. Absolutely. Yeah, finding another nature club or a herb group like you suggested, or like you guys, the Natural History Society, is just a really great way to get out there with people who are more experienced and just having those experiences safely can really alleviate a lot of fears. Sam wants to know the predominant species in Maryland and Pennsylvania. Um, Russ or anybody from, uh, uh, or Joe, do you, do you want to comment about that? That's going to be the timber rattlesnake up there. And Mariah, do you have uh, materials in languages other than English? We are working on translating a lot of our educator resources into Spanish right now. Um, we have been able to translate one of our um, informational brochures into Spanish, but it hasn't been posted yet on the website. And of course, if anyone here is fluent in other languages and wants to help with that, that's something that we could always use volunteers for because we would love to be able to produce these resources in a variety of other languages. Absolutely. We love volunteers. Definitely. All right, any other questions for Tiffany tonight on our last Must Learn Thursday, Rattlesnakes. Um, Russ is putting there's only one rattlesnake in Maryland, the timber, and the other venomous snake is the copperhead, um, mostly found in Western Maryland. Um, uh, Russ has invited everybody to his Facebook group for rattlesnakes, uh, East Coast Rattlers. So uh, check that out if you want to get more involved with, uh, with that. Um, Khalid says, why don't you try Google Translate to get your uh, materials into a different uh, language? Yeah, and Google Translate is a wonderful resource. Um, there can be some issues that come across during translation, and especially when we're talking about words like venomous that we don't necessarily have clear translations for. Um, so it's something we would still need um, somebody to review and make sure that it was accurate. Uh, and Khalid wants to know, what's the most venomous snake? Oh boy. <laughs> That's a hard question. Um, it can be really variable and venomous snakes in general can be so variable. Um, and it kind of just depends on what metric you're using to, to measure that. I would say in the United States, this venomous snake that's probably gonna have the highest venom yield, meaning the most venom that they can inject would be a large Eastern diamondback rattlesnake. But um, it doesn't mean that they're any more venomous than any of the other snakes. It's just, they can reach uh, really big sizes. It's the biggest uh, venomous snake in North America. So they can have a very um, high venom yield where they can just inject such large amounts. Okay. Any other questions? Get your questions in. Oh, let's see. Russ says uh, the U.S. rattlesnakes, the Mojave is considered the most toxic drop for drop. Yeah, and it depends on what metric you're using too. Um, the tiger rattlesnake has a really important, uh, really potent and toxic venom um, that's considered the most toxic, but it's there. They also have a very small head, so their venom yield is relatively small. So it, it really just depends. But any venomous snake bite is going to be a medical emergency. We always Do say the like one is the one that bit you. <laughs> Right. Do, do snakes like houses? Um, not necessarily. Snakes don't like to be around people in general. They like they're 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 kind of secretive and elusive, and they like to be in areas where they feel safe and secure. Um, but they do sometimes end up like under people's houses or in precarious spots on people's porches or things like that. Let's see. Khalid following up, what is the snake's favorite place? 
Well, it's really an interesting question because it gonna, it's going to depend on where, where you're at in the country. So a snake that lives in West Texas is probably going to like a really rocky area where they can hide in rocky crevices. And a snake here in Florida is going to like more sandy areas. Um, so it can be really different, but they love to be in places where they feel secure and they can hide. And, you know, especially if that place allows them to get any sunlight where they can still bask in the sun. Um, do you keep any personal venomous snakes? So we do have a facility here in Jacksonville and I'm the keeper who takes care of all of the snakes here at our facility. So I kind of consider them my personal snakes, but I don't have any venomous snakes in my home. All right. And we have probably have an open invitation to come down to Jacksonville to see the facility. Absolutely, please do. Uh, Charles, do are there other venomous snakes subject to roundups or is it just rattles? Um, it's just rattlesnakes and you might find the odd, you know, copperhead that gets thrown in with rattlesnakes at the pit, but that's not generally what they're going for. It's just rattlesnake roundups that we see. Um, Russ is saying there we're having a problem or Pennsylvania with SS, SFD. Um, uh, are we seeing that a lot in Maryland? I'm not sure what SFD is. I'm thinking it's a disease. Disease. Um, I'm not sure the numbers that they're seeing in Maryland, but I know that it does exist there and in, in pretty much a lot of other areas as well. And it looks like Russ confirmed. Yeah. Khalid asked, where are you in Jacksonville? So we're actually located inside of the Tree Hill Nature Center in Jacksonville. So um, if, you're, if you have time to visit the Tree Hill Nature Center, they have a little natural history museum there and 40 acres of trails and other animals. And our facility is located inside of their main building. Right. And Russell, um, we're, think, we're trying to plan a, a, a presentation on snake fungal disease uh, for 2022 for the club. So uh, stay tuned on that. All right, well, I am armed with so much new knowledge that I can share uh, over this holiday season and, uh, and, and help people better understand and appreciate um, and appreciate uh, Rattles, rattlesnakes. I found it fascinating to learn that even there's a venom difference in within species based on population. That is great information on on why um, it's important to save as many populations as possible. Love the information about the seed dispersal. Can't wait to learn more about that and the ticks. I mean, I, we are armed with so much great knowledge. Um, Thank you so much, Tiffany, for taking the time to share your work and your knowledge with us this evening. And thank you, everybody, for coming and spending some time with us uh, on a Must Learn Thursday. We hope that everybody stays well and stays curious and has a wonderful end of the year. And we can't wait to see you again in 2022 to keep learning uh, together with our community of the curious. I hope that we will see you online and in person at uh, some programs that are coming up. Um, so stay well, everybody. Take care.